Good morning and the greeting in Jesus' name this morning. I did not collaborate with John in his uh, devotional, but what he had to say about the Advent and prophecies and that kind of thing was, was a little bit in the same line I was thinking about. Uh, so the, as I thought about the, the place we are in time, and two weeks from now is uh, Christmas Day that we have chosen to celebrate. And uh, I guess I understand that it's not necessarily the day Jesus was actually born, but uh, we do have this time we celebrate. And I think rightly so, if we, we choose at least some time when we think about the fact that Jesus came, and he came as a baby. My thoughts went to uh, the idea of, of the prophecies of Christ, the prophecies in the Old Testament that speak of when Jesus was going to come. And... I discovered that there are so many that there would be no way for, you, for us to go over all of those prophecies in one morning, uh, half an hour service. So we'll probably just be highlighting some of the, I'll, that's all, I'll, I'll, all I'm able to do, just focus on a few of those prophecies. Uh, maybe. I would have a response from you. What would be the first prophecy of the coming of Jesus that you would find in the Old Testament? That's right. Let me read it. And the Lord said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon, the, upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. This prophecy has different ways of, of that, that you can look at it as being fulfilled. The first way is Jesus was born of a woman. It says, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. So Jesus was born of a woman. The second thing, Satan is the accuser of the brethren and the enemy of mankind. There, he's saying, I will put enmity, enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. There's enmity between Satan and mankind ever since. And the third thing is the bruise his heel. Jesus would suffer at the hands of of Satan. Uh, in, he used men to do that, but Jesus would suffer. And that was, that was in the very beginning when Adam and Eve were first fell from uh, the fellowship of, Je of God. Now, the second one, the so second prophecy, I'd like for you to turn to Genesis 22. We find that in Genesis 22, chapter six, or verse 16. And God is speaking to Abraham here. He said, and said, By myself I have sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing, and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heavens, of the heaven, and as a sand which is upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies, and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. Now, if you think about that, it seems like thy seed would mean all of the Israelites. Those are anybody that comes from you, Abraham. I will bless, or I will bless the nations through anybody who comes for, 
through you. And, and as you read that on a face value, that's what it seems like. But let's look at what the New Testament writer, Paul, says about this passage. Go to Galatians chapter 3, verse 6. Here in Galatians chapter 3, verse 6, it says, Just as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness, therefore know that only those who are of faith are the sons of Abraham. Only those who are of faith are the sons of Abraham. There are many sons of Abraham who are out there who are not faithful believers. I think we need to remember that. And verse 8 says, And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, In you all the nations shall be blessed. So here he's saying, in you, it's, it's in you, you had, how many of you know that Abraham is known as a father of the faithful? So, so Abraham, those who are following in Abraham's footsteps and trust and have faith in God are in that, in that uh, company of people. So then th those who are of faith are blessed along with believing Abraham. Now let's skip down to verse 16. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not, and to seeds as of many, but as of one. And to thy seed, which is Christ. This is what Paul said about that passage of scripture that we off, that you could at face value think that it means all the people of the, all the Jews but it's saying Paul says and to Abraham he says now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made he saith not into seeds as of many but as of one into thy seed which is Christ and this I say that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ the law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul, that it should make the promise of none effect. So just because the law came 430 years after, it does not make that promise that was made to Abraham to thy seed of none effect. So why was the law given? Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgressions till the seed Who's the seed? Christ. Till the seed should come to whom the promise was made, and it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Now, a mediator is not a mediator, mediator of one, but God is one. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid, for if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus, of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. So have you all discovered that you are under sin? Those who are at, at, at the age of accountability understand. You've discovered that you're under sin. You have a problem with sin. I have a problem with sin. It says here, the scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. So when you start believing, then you are becoming a part of the family of God, the family of Abraham. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. For wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith is come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster, for ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. 
There is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed. That, that word seed just really kept popping out at me. What is the seed of Abraham? Are we the seed of Abraham today? Those who are having faith are the seed of Abraham today. If ye be Christ's, then, ye, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Now, that phrase, if ye be Christ, caught my attention. In the first chapter of the Revelation, John writes, and, and if you want to, want to have a blessing, I started memorizing the book of Revelation some years ago, and I never completed it. But I did get the first chapter, and the next two or three chapters I, I don't have very well. But when I was repeating and having this in my heart, this verse continued to, to come, it, it jumped out at me. I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos. He's saying where he was. He was all by himself. I mean, what kind of a service could he do in the isle that is called Patmos? How would you feel if you'd be all by yourself in the isle that is called Patmos? Maybe, he, maybe there were a few people with him. I don't know. But the point I want to make is this. I was there for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. And my question is to you today. Are you where you are because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ? Are you where you are because of that today? Just think about that. John was able to say that. And I need to continue to ask myself, am I where I am? Because this is where Jesus Christ wants me to be today. And if ye be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed, heirs according to the promise. See, to be Christ's means more than just to acknowledge something about Jesus. To actually be Christ, that means we are, we are owned by Jesus. We are, we are bought with a price. He, he bought us. What is, what is the cost of our redemption? The cost of our redemption is that his, that his heel had to be bruised. Now, his body, it's interesting to me that, his, that Jesus' body that was bruised is only considered the heel. Thou shalt bruise his heel. But... That was just a small part of who Jesus actually is. Jesus is a lot more than just his body. Uh, whatever that means. There's so much in the scripture that we can think about, that we can meditate on, that we can consider. But is, if ye are Christ, he, he has a hold on your life. He has a hold on my life. I, John, was in who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Am I where I am because I belong to Christ? Just something I want to throw out to you to meditate on. Are you where you are because of Jesus? Now, let's go to another prophecy. Micah 5.2, and Jonathan already talked about that today. But thou... Bethlehem Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is to be a ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. The prophecy was fulfilled in that Jesus was born in Bethlehem, and Bethlehem was a tiny, tiny, it says, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet you're going to be born in Bethlehem. The, Jesus is born. And that's where Jesus was born. He was born in Bethlehem, a tiny little obscure village. And, you know, we, 
each of you live in some place. And why Jesus chose Bethlehem, why God chose Bethlehem, I don't know. But out of Bethlehem came the thousands and millions of people who are actually believing in Jesus, who are Abraham's seed, who are now uh, brought into the family of God. I'd like to go to Isaiah 61, verse 1. It says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give them unto them beauty for ashes, and oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. Now, if you look at that scripture at face value, you think Isaiah was the one who, was, who had the spirit of the Lord upon him, and the, the Lord had appointed him to, uh, to preach good tidings unto the meek. He sent him to bind up the brokenhearted. He sent him to pro proclaim liberty to the captives. Isaiah did that. But it's also interesting to see the many, many times that a scripture that was for their time, in their time, also had meaning for Jesus. And Jesus then stood up in the temple. Luke records it in chapter 4, verse 18, and he reads that chapter, that part, that section out of Isaiah. He says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, recovering sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, bruised to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And Jesus closed the book and he gave it again to the minister and sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. Jesus got up and he, he took on that scripture, said, this is my purpose for being here. I can't imagine what it was like. It's like probably maybe a pin drop, and you could hear it. It was quiet. The eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him because he was saying, and then he began to say to them, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Now, this scripture was not only being fulfilled in their ears, but as Jesus kept living, this scripture became fulfilled in their eyes as well. It, there's, it's very inspiring to see those Old Testament, the, the whole of the Old Testament is pointing to the New Testament. It's pointing to Jesus who was the fulfillment of that prophecy. And we still get inspired by that in our life today. And we know that when the Spirit of God comes into our lives, changes happen and good things happen. Now, I would like for, to, to have the main section here. Let's turn to Isaiah chapter 53. And I would like for you, you can, you can uh, stand up for the reading of the word here. Isaiah chapter 53, and I don't know if you want to take your finger and go like this, 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 as you see scriptures, as you see the prophecy that Isaiah had in chapter 53, in your mind, uh, how many of these different things were fulfilled by Jesus? Uh, all, you might come up with different, because some of them are, are kind of a clump of, of things, but I'm going to read it, and you just think about what Jesus did, how he fulfilled this scripture. 
Verse 1, who has believed our report? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness. And when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our, for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living, from the transgression of my people. For the transgression of my people he was stricken, and they made his grave with the wicked and with the rich at his death, because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Because he poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. You may be seated. How many, how many different prophecies, fulfilled prophecies did you see? Anyone want to, want to stick out your... You lost count at 20. Okay. Anyone else? I didn't do it here in my, but I just have highlighted some, and I, I'm in that 20 range as well. When we think about it, he is despised and rejected of men a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. We hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we seemed him not. That happened when, when he was put on the cross. It happened before that. Uh, he was despised. He was rejected of men. He was a man of sorrows. Uh, it, it's, it's that kind of thing that happened. Uh, when the, he hath no form nor comeliness... They had tortured him to the point of being unrecognizable, I believe. No form nor comeliness. When we sh shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. I don't think that that was necessarily how Jesus grew up in the beginning because it said Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. I think there was some some drawing power there. There was something there about Jesus that people wanted to come. I think he actually probably was a beautiful child. And I think he was a, a person that people liked to come to and talk to. But when he was on the cross, it was completely different. He was, had no form nor comeliness. Verse 4, He hath borne our griefs, carried our sorrows, 
we don't like to be associated with so many times we we don't like we don't, we like to separate ourselves from from we don't like to think about the sufferings of Jesus uh, and I think how should I say this I understand that there are when you graphically think about that uh, years many years ago I had a message where I talked about the sufferings of Jesus and I talked about the all the different things that he experienced and how it felt and I had a man come up to me after where he said my wife can't handle that don't do that again well there is some truth to that but it at the same time, I think what we don't realize is what Jesus actually went through when he suffered and he died on the cross. And yet there was even much more than that. There was emotional pain. There was emotional, there was physical, emotional, there was spiritual desertion by, G, by God that happened. He bore our griefs. He carried our sorrows. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. With his stripes, we are healed. With his stripes, we are healed. I don't believe that's necessarily a a physical healing, but it is a spiritual healing. Something that happened to my first wife when... When she was in the hospital with leukemia, somebody came in and told her, if you have enough faith, you're going to be healed. By his stripes, you're healed. What kind of pressure does that put on a person in the hospital? So if she's not healed, then that means she didn't have enough faith And if she didn't have enough faith, then what does that do to her standing, her trust in God being able to take care of her in heaven? There's another dimension to that. We believe that she was healed perfectly. She just got there before the rest of us. So to say that, that, then I I asked a question. So at what point do we think that at what point do we uh, say that it's that we're old enough now to die? Because if you're always thinking if you have enough faith, then you're going to be healed. I, I want and probably at 80 or 90 years old, I still want to have enough faith that I'm going to be healed. Uh, you know, at what what point? There is a pan, there's a point unto man once to die, and after that to judgment. I think each of us has a certain amount of time. I don't know how much time I have. You don't know how much time you have. But what time we have, we can be of the seed of Abraham. We can be a part of God's kingdom. We can have faith and trust that God is taking care of us. By his, we can have trust that by his stripes we are healed spiritually, emotionally, and this physical body is a, is a tiny little part of our whole being. Let's just not forget that. The Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. That is a prophecy that's fulfilled. He was brought as a lamb to the slaughter, a prophecy that's fulfilled. He opened not his mouth when he was when he was under pressure there. Prophecy that was fulfilled. He was cut off out of the land of of the living probably when he was 33 years old. that mean, very, It seems like before his time. Fulfilled prophecy. He made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. That's where they buried him. Prophecy fulfilled. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many. Who is... Who is justifying you? Who is making you righteous before God? Jesus Christ, my righteous servant. By his knowledge, he shall justify many. He knows me inside and out. He knows my need, and he makes me right with him. 
Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide, divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death. He was numbered with the transgressors. He bare the sins of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Just remember, who is, who, who, uh, how should I say this? What are our ca calendars? Where do our calendars start? There's so many, many things. Jesus has made a bigger impression in our world than any other person ever in, in the great men of, of the past have ever made. I had a, a little poem, I don't know where it's at, that talks about all the different ways that Jesus affected the world. And when you stop and read those, all those different ways, then you just sit back and say, that's right, that's right, that's true. And I didn't have much to give this morning, but I just want you to think about it. The prophecies of Jesus that were in the Old Testament and how they're fulfilled and when I think of the word the advent, uh, I think of the word adventure as well. It's something that as we keep living and we look forward, a lot of the things that we do, we look forward. There, a lot of the things we do are not completely fulfilled yet. We have dreams. How many of you have dreams over tomorrow and the next day and the next day and the next day? That's, that's what you look forward to. What, what is the most important thing you look forward to? The day when we see Jesus. There's, I don't think we have this. Karen's been again, reading, listening to this song. Uh, there's a song called uh, Yes, It Will Be Worth It All. Is anybody, that song isn't in here uh, in our son, song books, is it? Okay. But It Will Be Worth It All When We See Jesus. Life's trials will seem so small when we see Christ. Let's remember that, and let's kneel for prayer.